Hello and welcome to my presentation for Edexcel A-Level Chemistry Topic 5, Four Mini Equations and Amounts of Substance. Um, as always, make sure you're taking notes, you know, re, uh, re-reading and re-watching any of the more difficult bits and particularly with the calculations. Perhaps try and do them uh, yourself on the calculator and work along with me because this is particularly sort of hard stuff. So um, you're going to need to put that extra effort in. So the mole. This is the most important concept in this topic, uh, and it is the unit of measurement for the amounts of substances. In a bit like meters is the unit of measurement for distance, and kilograms is the unit of measurement for mass, moles is the unit of measurement for amounts of substance. So if we say we've got one mole of carbon and one mole of, let's say, water, H2O, even though those things would have a different mass, it's the same amount because it's one mole of each. Now, there is no way to measure moles directly. It's not like you know, length, which we can measure with a ruler, or mass, which we can measure with a balance. There is no mole meter. So we measure it instead um, indirectly using the idea of molar mass. Now, molar mass has this symbol here, capital M. Very, very simple. It is just the mass of one mole of a substance in grams. So to work it out, it's really easy. Just take the relative atomic mass or the relative formula mass of a substance and just add on the units grams per mole at the end, g mole to the minus one. So for example, the molar mass of lithium is 6.9 grams per mole. The molar mass of lead here is 207.2 grams per mole. Really importantly, 6.9 grams of lithium and 207.2 grams of lead is the same amount of each substance. Another example, we might have um, 18 grams of water and 180 grams of glucose. 18 grams of water and 180 grams of glucose are the same amount of substance, even though their masses are very different. That is the idea of the mole. Now, a lot of this topic focuses on doing calculations of amounts of moles from various different starting points. And we're going to start off looking at how to calculate moles from the mass of a substance. And we're going to use this equation here. Super easy. The amount of substance in moles equals the mass of that substance in grams divided by the molar mass of that substance in grams per mole. And we can, we can um, look at that as a symbol version as n equals little m over big M. So, for example, what is the mass of 3.5 moles of methane? Well, super easy. We need to uh, write out our equation first of all. So we had n equals m over m up here. So if we rearrange that to make mass the subject, it's going to be mass equals number of moles times the molar mass. So in this case, that is the mass of methane we're talking about. So let's just present this nicely. Okay, equals 3.5 times by the molar mass. Now, we don't know the molar mass of methane yet, but let's just work it out quickly. So, molar mass of methane equals um, 1 times 12 for carbon plus 4 times 1 for hydrogen. That equals 16. So, we're going to have 3.5 times 16, and that is going to come to 56 grams. Now, Example number two, what quantity in moles of fluorine atoms is present in 101.7 grams of BF3? And example two, what quantity in moles of fluorine atoms is present in 101.7 grams of BF3? This is going to be a bit more difficult because we're looking not at the number of moles of BF3, but the number of moles of fluorine atoms in the BF3. So let's see how that pans out. So we're going to need to start off by calculating the number of moles of BF3. So we're going to say this, we're going to say N for number of moles. N, oh, sorry, pen's not working. N for number of moles of BF3 equals mass over molar mass. Now we don't know the molar mass yet, so let's just work that out quickly. So we're going to say M of BF3 equals um, 10.8 for boron plus 3 lots of 19 for fluorine and that is going to come to 67.8 grams per mole okay 
So we can work out our number of moles of BF3 now. So that is going to be um, 101.7. That's our mass over our molar mass equals 67.8. And that comes to 1.5. However, we don't care about the number of moles of BF3. What we're looking for is the number of moles of fluorine atoms in that many moles of BF3. So we're going to say the number of moles of fluorine equals 1.5 times by 3, because every BF3 has three fluorine atoms in it. So 1.5 times 3 equals 4.5 moles, and that is our final answer. The Avogadro constant L tells us the number of particles or repeat units in one mole of a substance. What I mean by repeat units, let's imagine we're talking about, say, um, uh, calcium chloride, which is uh, an ionic compound. It's the number of times the calcium chloride unit is repeated in one mole. We can't talk about molecules because it doesn't form molecules. So L is this number here, 6.02 times 10 to the 24. You need to memorize that. You won't be given that in an exam. You can see it written here. To pronounce that number, that is 602 million trillion. Now, just to give you an idea of how unimaginably vast that number is, let's imagine you wanted to count up to 602 million trillion. If you did so at the rate of one number per second, without eating, sleeping, or taking any other kind of break, it would take you approximately 1.4 million times the current age of the universe to count that far. So it's a, it's a, it's a huge number. So what does that mean in practice? Let's have a look. Go back to our example of lithium. So we've got 6.9 grams of lithium is one mole of lithium. 207.2 grams of lead is one mole of lead. So what we can say here then is 6.9 grams of lithium and 207.2 grams of lead both contain 6.02 times 10 to the 23 atoms. Going back to our glucose and water example, one mole of each of those, so 18 grams of water and 180 grams of glucose, both contain 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules. A huge, huge number. So we need to be able to do calculations where we use Avogadro's number to calculate the number of atoms um, given a number of moles or to calculate the number of moles given a number of atoms. Um, and we're going to use this equation here. Nice and easy. Number of atoms, molecules or formula units equals the quantity in moles times by Avogadro's constant. N equals n, little n, times L. Capital N is your number of particles and little n is your moles. And we've already seen that L is Avogadro's number. So how does that look in practice? Let's look at example three first of all. So example three, we are trying to find the quantity in moles. So we need to rearrange to make N the subject or N the subject rather. So we're going to say N equals N divided by L. Number of particles divided by Avogadro's number. So we've got 1.505 times 10 to the 23 divided by 6.02 times 10 to the 23. And that is going to come to 0 0.250. Now you may be asking, why haven't I written 0 0.25? That's because given that I've got at least three significant figures here, I need to give my answer to three significant figures. Otherwise, I'm losing accuracy unnecessarily. So that last little O there becomes really important. Example four, how many carbon atoms are present in 42 grams of ethene? So we're being, we, we, need, you know, we need to think this through in a bit more detail, first of all, because we're not asking how many molecules of ethene, we're asking how many carbon atoms there are within that many molecules of ethene. So we'll have to work out the number of molecules of ethene first and then multiply that by two to get the number of atoms of carbon. So let's rearrange our, well, we've got our equation rather. So we've got number of atoms or molecules rather, C2H4 equals N times L. But we've got a little problem. We don't know the number of moles of ethene. So let's work that out. Um, so number of moles of ethene equals the mass over the molar mass. That is 42 over 12 times 2, so that's 2 lots of carbon, plus 4 times 1, 4 lots of hydrogen, and that will come to 1.5 if you do that maths. Okay, 
So we're going to say 1.5 times Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23, running out of space. And that's going to come to 9.01 times 10 to the 23 molecules of ethene. So the number of carbon atoms equals that times 2. So we're going to say 9.01 times 10 to 23 times 2. And that is going to come to 18.02 times 10 to the 23, i.e. 1.80 times 10 to the 24. So what we had to do here, just to recap, was we had to work out the number of moles of ethene first, then the number of atoms, or so and molecules of ethene, and then double that to get the number of atoms of carbon in that many molecules of ethene. Empirical formula. This is the simplest whole number ratio of the atoms of the different elements in a compound. And if we're talking about ionic uh, or giant covalent substances, that is the only kind of formula we have. With molecular substances, sometimes the molecular formula and empirical formula are different. So for example, you might have hydrazine, which is N2H4, that's his molecular formula. The empirical formula is NH2. The uh, empirical formula for butane is C, so molecular formula for butane is C4H10. Empirical formula C2H5. For glucose C6H2O6, the empirical formula CH2O. How do we get from here to here? What we do is we just look for the highest common factor of each of the um, numbers of atoms, and we just divide by that number. So here, the highest common factor of two and four is 2. So divide these by 2, you're going to get that. Highest common factor of 4 and 10 is 2. So divide these by 2, you get that. Highest common factor of 6, 12 and 6 is 6. So divide that by um, 6 and you will get CH2O. Now, why is an empirical formula called an empirical formula? Well, this word empirical means something like from data or from measurements or observations. And so that's the important thing. We can determine an empirical formula using observations that we can make in the laboratory. And if we look at this method here, this is the kind of experiment we can do to determine an empirical formula. So in this experiment, what you do is you have some red copper oxide here. It looks grey. I promise you it's red. Let's just colour it in. There's our nice red copper oxide. Okay. And we have it in this thing called a reduction tube. And what happens is we have gas going in here, okay? And we heat it very, very strongly with a Bunsen burner. And we have a little hole here for the gas to come out. And we set light to that. So there's a flame there and there's a flame here. Now, here's the thing. The gas in the gas supply contains methane, CH4. And when the copper oxide, the red copper oxide here, reacts with methane, it makes copper and carbon dioxide and water. So if we weigh this at the start, if we know how much red copper oxide we've got at the start, at the end of the reaction, it would be only copper because all the oxygen had been lost. So if we measure the change in mass, that will tell us how much oxygen we've lost. And it also tells us how much is left as just pure copper. And then we can use those numbers together to work out the empirical formula using the kind of maths that we're going to see on the next slide. Determining the empirical formula of a compound um, from percentage composition by mass. For example, this kind of problem. A compound was found to contain 85.5% mercury and 13.64% oxygen by mass, with the remaining mass being hydrogen. Now to solve this kind of problem, layout is going to be super important, so I'll show you how to do that in a second. Then we're going to divide by the relative atomic mass of each um, uh, element. Then we're going to divide by the smallest answer. The point of this is to get our answer into a ratio. And then we're going to multiply by the denominator of any obvious fractions. That sounds a bit cryptic. We're not going to use that on this slide, but on the, on the next one, that is going to be relevant. So we'll come back to that. Now, as I said, we're going to start off by laying out the data. So we've got mercury, that is Hg. Then we've got oxygen. Then we've got hydrogen. Now, laying it out in this format 
um, as sort of ratios the whole way through really helps you to make sense of which numbers are which and to get things in the right place. So we said 85.5% is mercury, so 85.5 goes there. We can treat these percentage figures as if they are a mass in grams. So we don't need to do anything special with them just because it says percent. So 85.5, then we've got 13.64 um, for oxygen. Hydrogen will need to be calculated. So the total comes to 100%, so we're going to do 100 minus 85.5 minus 13.64 uh, and that is going to come to 0.86 for hydrogen. That is that step done. Next step is to divide by the relative atomic mass for each thing. So relative atomic mass for hydrogen is 206. So if we divide 85.5 by 200, sorry, 0.6, we get an answer of 0.42. 6.2. If we divide oxygen by its relative atomic mass of 16, we get um, 0.8525. And if we divide um, hydrogen by its atomic mass, which is 1, we get 0 0.86. Now, we need to work out the ratio of these things to each other. You should more or less be able to see by eye that... Um, these are basically the same size and uh, they are double the mercury. However, if you're not sure, the way to get these into a simple ratio is to divide by the smallest answer. Okay. Um, and if you do that, you would have 0 0.4262 divided by 0 0.4262, which clearly equals 1. 0 0.8525 divided by 0.4262 equals 2.00 and 0.86 divided by 0.4262 equals 2.01 i.e. it basically uh, equals 2. Okay. So what we can see here is we've got a ratio of mercury to oxygen to hydrogen of 1 to 2 to 2. So our empirical formula will be HgO2 h2 so to recap the steps we're going to lay out the data that was this section up here divide by the relative of atomic mass and then divide by the smallest to turn it into um, uh, a simple ratio this step here was not necessary um, but will be on the next slide so let's see how that will look okay so determining a molecular formula from composition by mass. So in this example, we've got um, a sample of a compound with a mass of 7.05 grams was found to contain 5.77 grams of carbon and 1.28 grams of hydrogen. And so we've got to determine its molecular formula if its molar mass is 132 grams per mole. So we're going to add another stage onto the end of our calculation, which we're going to come to at the end. Um, and let's just remind ourselves of the um, process we're going to lay out the data we're going to divide by AR we're going to divide by the smallest and then we're going to multiply by the denominator of obvious fractions this step will come into play on this one so let's see what that will look like when we get to it now lay out the data first of all so we're going to do it as a ratio same as last time so C dot dot H and then put the data from the question in so for carbon we've got 5.77 grams and for hydrogen We've got 1.28 grams. That is the first step done. Second step is divide by AR. So in this case for carbon, we're dividing by 12. Check the periodic table if you're not sure. And that will come to um, 0 0.4808. And then for hydrogen, we're divided by 1. So just 1.28. Now, if in case you're not sure what we're doing here, by dividing by the relative atomic mass, we're essentially turning things into numbers in moles. So what we've got here, 0 0.4808 and 1.28, is a ratio in moles. It's just not a very clear, simple ratio. So that's why. So we've done, done the divide by AR, but now we need to get our ratio into a simpler one. So we're going to divide by the smallest answer. The smallest answer is 0 0.4808. So obviously, if we divide that by 0 0.4808, we're going to get 1. Okay. But we also need to divide 1.28 by 0 0.4808. So 0 0.4808. Okay. 
And if we do that, we get 2.662. Now that is clearly not a nice simple ratio. And the problem is it, with it is like sometimes you can round these ratios up uh, or down, but only if it's very close to a whole number. 2.66 is a long way from a whole number. But here comes our step uh, four to the rescue. So it says multiply by the denominator of obvious fractions. Now this 0.66 here, okay, that should look suspiciously to you like two thirds. Two thirds is 0.666666, you know, 0 0.67, okay. So the denominator of this obvious fraction is three. So we're going to multiply both our answers by three, so one times three and 2.66 times three. And if we do that, we get an answer of three for carbon and eight for hydrogen. So our empirical formula is C3H8. So you do need to look out for these obvious fractions. So if you see sort of 0 0.66, 0 0.33, that is gonna be two thirds and one third respectively. So you're gonna to need to multiply by, um, by uh, three, okay? If you see, say, 0 0.5, that is um, a half. So you're going to multiply by two. If you see 0.25-ish or 0.75-ish, that is um, one quarter and three quarters. So you need to multiply by four. So do be on the lookout for those obvious fractions. Now, we've got our empirical formula, but we are not finished because we need to find out the molecular formula. And to do that, we really need to see how many times our empirical formula fits in to the molar mass and that will give us our molecular formula. So to do that we need to find the relative formula mass of C3H8. So we're going to say the molar mass of C3H8 equals 3 times carbon plus 8 times hydrogen. Okay, So that is 3 times 12 plus 8 times 1. 3 times 12 is 36, plus 8 is 44. Okay. Now, we're going to see how many times that mass of 44 fits into 132. So the only way to do that is to um, divide. So we're going to do 132 over 44. That equals 3. So what that tells me now is that the empirical formula fits into the molecular formula three times. So our molecular formula is just going to be C3H8 times by, multiplied by three. So three times three is nine, so C9. Eight times three is 24, so H24. And there is our final answer. So just a reminder of that key step about spotting those obvious fractions. So look for 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.75, 0 0.66, 0 0.33, any, anything close to those kind of numbers, and you're going to need to multiply through by those obvious fractions. The gas laws. Now, we'll find that gases uh, probably don't follow your expectations. So if you think about some of the factors that you think would affect the volume of a gas, you, would, you might think of temperature. We know that things expand when they're hot, so higher temperature more volume of gas, that makes sense. You would think about pressure, we met that at GCSE, so um, higher pressure would kind of compress the gas and make the volume smaller. And then you would think about the gas itself, you'd think, I know, helium is made of tiny atoms, methane is made of big molecules, so methane takes up more space, and there you would be wrong. Because what we find is that the volume of a gas depends on the temperature, and the units for that are in Kelvin. The pressure, the units for that are in pascals. The amount of gas, the units for that are moles. But importantly, it does not depend on what the gas is. Now that sounds counterintuitive, but let's just think about this diagrammatically. Okay? The particles in a gas are really far apart. So let's imagine we had some gas made out of blue particles. Okay? You might have one particle there one particle over here somewhere okay 
most of the volume of, ga of the gas is actually created by the empty space uh, between the particles, not the particles themselves. Now imagine now we had some particles of a bigger gas. Those particles are equally far apart. Okay. But because most of the space is actually just empty space, change in the size of the particles is not going to significantly affect the overall volume of the gas. And this leads us to something called the ideal gas equation. PV equals nRT. P is pressure. V is volume. N is the number of moles. T is the temperature in Kelvin. And R is this value here. R is a value called the gas constant, which is 8.31 joules per Kelvin per mole. Just remember that 8.31 number. You need to use that in a lot of calculations. Okay. Now, we can describe gases as being ideal or non-ideal. An ideal gas is a gas that perfectly follows the behaviour that you'd expect from the PV equals NRT um, uh, equation. So, for example, we've got Charles's law here. This shows that for an ideal gas, as you increase the temperature in kelvins, the volume of the gas will increase if the pressure is being kept constant. And you get a direct proportion straight line for that. We've got Boyle's law, which tells us that um, if we keep the temperature constant, increasing the pressure of a gas will decrease the volume and vice versa. We've got Guy uh, Gay-Lussac's law, which tells us that if uh, if we keep the um, te uh, volume constant, increasing the temperature will increase the pressure. And again, we get a nice direct proportion straight line. And we've got Avogadro's law, which tells us that if we increase the number of moles, we increase the volume if pressure and temperature are kept constant. Now, these are all ideal gases. If we had a non-ideal gas, what you would see is that you wouldn't get these nice straight line graphs. They would sort of veer off like that, okay? Or they do something like that. Um, this one might do that. So um, we find that in reality there are no ideal gases, but we can talk about gases that are more or less ideal. And gases with sim that get that are simple have low boiling points. They are close to ideal. So things like helium, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. If we graph their various different um, properties, we see graphs very similar to these ones here. However, if we have gases with boiling points that are close to room temperature, they tend to be less uh, ideal. So gases, for example, like ammonia, um, butane, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, those don't show the same extent of ideal gas behavior. Now, this is slightly academic because you can assume that all of the gases you're going to meet in calculations are ideal gases, even though that's not strictly a valid assumption. Measuring the molar mass of a gas uh, or of a, um, a volatile liquid. Um, what we're going to do here, four steps. First step is to weigh a sample of a liquid, um, uh, whether that's a volatile liquid at room temperature or a gas that has been cooled down until it liquefies. We're going to weigh the sample of a liquid, then we're going to place it inside a sealed syringe and warm it in an oven until the gas evaporates uh, and expands to uh, whatever size it needs to expand to. What we can do then is we can record the volume. And if we record the volume, the pressure and the temperature, we can use that ideal gas equation, PV, seconds, uh, PV equals nRT. We can use that ideal gas equation to calculate the number of moles we've got. And if we know the mass, we can then work out the molar mass from the number of moles and the mass. So let's see how this works in practice. Um, we're going to have 4.43 grams of a substance with the empirical formula C2H3 vaporizes and occupies a volume of 0.247 decimeters cubed when heated at 9.6 degrees Celsius at a pressure of 777.7 kilopascals. Now note in this question we're actually going to go beyond just finding the molar mass to actually then use that to find the molecular formula as well. So let's see how this works in practice. So we've got PV equals NRT. 
So to find the number of moles of gas, we're going to do N equals PV over RT. So let's have a look at that. So we're going to say N equals PV over RT. Okay, equals um, the pressure is 777.7 times by the volume 0.247 divided by RT. R is the gas constant, 8.31 times by the temperature. Now remember, temperature must be in kelvins. So we've got to add 273 to that. So we're going to say times by 9.6 plus 273. Uh, and that will equal um, 0 0.08180 um, moles. Okay. Now, Note that because I've got three significant figures here, I'm going to try and give my answer to one more than that. So four significant figures in the answer. Now that is the number of moles. We now need to work out the molar mass. So the molar mass, if you remember, number of moles equals mass over molar mass. Therefore, the molar mass, which we need to find out, the molar mass equals the mass over the number of moles. So the mass is given here, 4.43 grams. We've just found the number of moles here. So divide that by 0 0.08180. And what we get is a molar mass of 54.1 grams per mole. Okay, so that is our molar mass. However, we're not quite finished yet because we need to determine the molecular formula. So the, it says the empirical formula is C2H3. So we need to see how many times C2H3 fits into that 54.1. So let's work out the, the empirical formula. So we're going to do M of C2H3 equals um, 2 times 12 for carbon plus 3 times 1 for hydrogen equals 27. So if we do 54.1 over 27, okay, and that comes out to 2.00. Therefore, we need to multiply the empirical formula by 2. So we're going to have the final answer. I know it's getting a bit cramped here. Final answer is going to be C. 2 times 2 is 4. And 3 times 2 is 6, so C4H6, and that is our final answer. Just a little note here. Um, although the standard units for volume are meters cubed, and the standard units for pressure are um, pascals, we can actually use units of decimeters cubed and kilopascals without converting, because if you convert meters cubed into decimeters cubed, you would de... Um, uh, so to convert decimeters cubed into meters cubed, you would divide by a thousand. To convert pascals into kilopascals, you would multiply by a thousand. So those two conversions cancel each other out. So actually, you can use decimeters cubed and kilopascals quite happily without the need to convert. The molar volume of a gas at room temperature and pressure is about 24 decimeters cubed. Um, what do we mean by room temperature and pressure? Well, room temperature is 298 Kelvin. That's roughly 25 degrees Celsius, and 100 kilopascals, that is atmospheric pressure. Now, how do we work out this 24? Well, we just do it by setting the number of moles equals to 1 and solving PV equals NRT using these numbers here. Now, I don't need to go through that, but if you do it, it comes out to not exactly 24, but around about 24. And certainly 24 is close enough that we can use it in calculations. So it leaves us with this really straightforward calculation that says, provided we're at room temperature and pressure, the number of moles of a gas equals the volume of the gas in decimeters cubed divided by 24. So let's see how this works in practice. So we've got this question here. It says, in the reaction uh, of calcium carbonate with hydrochloric acid, 35.6 centimeters cubed of carbon dioxide gas was collected over the course of 30 seconds at room temperature and pressure. 
what quantity is this in moles? Now we're getting this quite a lot of excess information here. It doesn't matter what the gas is because um, one mole of any gas occupies the same volume. And it doesn't matter how long it took because uh, the time is just irrelevant. What does matter though is this statement here about room temperature and pressure because that tells you we can use this 24 number as our molar volume. So the calculation is going to be really simple. We're going to say that the uh, quantity of moles, so N for CO2 carbon dioxide, equals the volume over 24, okay, which equals 35.6, but it's not 35.6 because we need to divide that by 1,000 to convert it into decimeters cubed. So rather than 35.6, it's going to be 0 0.035 six decimeters cubed so we're going to say equals 0 0.0356 over 24 and that gives us an answer of 1.48 times 10 to the minus 3 moles and there's our answer so provided we're at room temperature and pressure we can shortcut our equations with gases by just dividing by 24 one of the key things we need to be able to do in this topic is to use a balanced chemical equation like this to answer questions like if you've got x grams of um, iron how many grams of carbon must you have started with and to answer these questions we're going to need to use the concept of the mole ratio now the coefficients in a chemical reaction the coefficients are these numbers okay so the big two the big three, the big four, the big three. Those are called coefficients. Those coefficients are really just a series of ratios and specifically mole ratios. So for example, we can say that the, in this equation, the mole ratio of iron oxide to carbon is two to three because there are two iron oxides to three carbons. We can say the mole ratio of iron oxide to iron is two to four because there are two iron oxides to four irons. You can, if you want, simplify that to one to two, but frankly, there's no need, and I think it just confuses things a bit. We can look at the mole ratio of carbon to carbon dioxide. That is three to three. And um, again, we can simplify it to one to one, but I don't think there's any need. Again, I just think it complicates things. And mole ratios, we're going to learn, are the key to calculating reacting quantities in terms of moles. So calculating reacting quantities in terms of moles. Let's look at the example kind of problem we'll see and then how we go about doing it. So, for example, in the reaction below, what is the minimum quantity in moles of HClO4 required to produce 2.98 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of Cl2O7? Okay. So, what we're going to do first of all is identify the species of interest. What do I mean by that? Well, what we're going to do is just underline on our equation which things we care about because that just helps to focus our minds so it says what is the minimum quantity of moles of HClO4 so let's just underline that HClO4 okay. and then it's required to produce 2.98 times the minus 3 moles of Cl2O7 so that's that one there now you don't have to do this but you can just scribble the others out because they are unimportant to us let's just focus our minds on what we need okay then you need to set up your mole ratio problem and you're going to do this in the form of a fraction so we're going to put our data on top so the data is the information from the question so in this case it says 2.98 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of Cl2O7 so let's put that there 2.98 times 10 to the minus 3 moles okay and then it's asking us about the number of moles of HClO4. Now we don't know that, so let's just call it X because X is what we often use for an unknown quantity. Then we're going to put the mole ratio on the bottom. So there are going to be 12 HClO4s, so let's put 12 there underneath it. And there are going to be six Cl2O7s, six there. So let's put six here. Okay, and what we can do then is turn this into a ratio problem like that and all we need to do now then is solve for x 
So x over 12 equals 2.98 times 10 to the minus 3 over 6. So we can rearrange that by bringing x up to here. So we can say now that x equals 2.98 times 10 to the minus 3 over 6 times 12. And if we solve that, we're going to come to 5.96 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. Now note here how the presentation really helps you. If you write things directly underneath where, what they're concerned about, okay, and present it like this, you can very easily turn the data into a problem and it will solve the question for you. But it is important that you try and understand the maths that's happening here. So all we're doing here is we're saying that for the reaction to happen kind of once, or every, every one time the reaction happens, you're going to produce six lots of Cl207. So by doing 2.98 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 6, what you're doing is you're kind of working out how many times the reaction happens. Uh, and a similar thing is happening over here. And uh, by multiplying by 12, we end up finding out how many x's we must have also started with. That's, that's a rough kind of explanation. To calculate the masses of chemicals involved in chemical reactions, we're going to do another mole ratio problem, but this time we're going to start off by converting a mass of a chemical into a number of moles, and we're going to finish off by converting the number of moles of chemical back into a mass. Okay. So, and our mole ratio problem is going to be stuck in the middle somewhere. So, look, how does this look in practice? So, let's look at example 10. So, in the reaction below, what is the minimum mass of H2 required to react fully with 14.4 kilograms? of carbon. So we're starting with carbon, we know about carbon, so we need to work out the number of moles of carbon first. So we're going to say the number of moles of carbon N of C equals mass over molar mass m over M. So the mass of carbon is not going to be 14.4 but 14,400 because we need to convert kilograms into grams, so 14,400 over 12 and that will come to 1,200 moles of carbon. Now, we're going to need to work out the number of moles of hydrogen. And to do that, that's where we're going to use our mole ratio thing. So remember how we worked out the mole ratio. So we identify the things we care about. So that is hydrogen and carbon. And we ignore everything else. You don't need to scribble them out, but um, I just like to. It's cathartic. Um, so we're going to... Um, put our data on the top. So our number of moles of carbon was 1200. Okay. And our number of moles of hydrogen, we don't know, so we could call that X. Okay. And then on the bottom of our mole ratio problem, we're going to have the coefficients from the equation. So two carbons and three hydrogens. And there's our problem set up. So now we just need to solve for x. So we can say x equals uh, 1200 over 2 times by 3, because we need to bring that up to the top there. So times by 3 equals 1800 moles. Now rem remember that that x we just found out, that unknown is the number of moles of H2. So to find out the mass of H2, really easy. We're going to say m of h2 equals the number of moles, n, times the molar mass. So that is 1,800 times by the molar mass of hydrogen. That is super easy, that one. That is just two, because it's two lots of hydrogen. Each hydrogen is one. So 1,800 times two, and that is going to come to 3,600 grams, or 3.60 kilograms. Job done. So to recap what we did was we got a mass and converted it into moles. Then we did our mole ratio problem and then we got the number of moles and we converted it back into a mass. As we saw earlier in the topic, the volume of a gas depends only on the number of moles. So we can monitor gases during reactions by measuring changes in their volume using gas syringes. This is a gas syringe here. It's normally made of glass and the plunger slides in and out very easily 
um, and will slide out as uh, gas is added to the syringe or slide in as gas is used up and it's got these little graduations on the side so that we can um, read off the volume of gas. So in this example we've got gas being produced in the conical flask and it bubbles up into the measuring cylinder so into the gas syringe and we can measure off how much is being produced. Um, in this reaction here what's happening is um, the copper reacts with oxygen that's in the air in these two connected gas syringes and so these gas syringes will move inwards as the reaction proceeds and this will um, I mean this method can be used to measure the amount of oxygen in the air and um, but importantly because we're using up the oxygen the volume will go down now really important with these is that when you measure your volumes you must control for temperature so that means um, making sure that whenever you take your measurements you're um, at room temperature or whatever temperature you want it to be um, because gas volumes change with temperature as we've already seen so in terms of looking at reacting quantities involving gases if we're only looking at gases it's really easy and the reason why is because if two gases are at the same temperature and pressure their volume is analogous to the number of moles that doesn't mean their volume is the same as the number of moles but it means that their volume is in direct proportion to the number of moles so we don't need to bother about doing any fancy conversions the problem just becomes a simple straightforward mole ratio problem so what does that mean in practice let's look at this um, calculation here so example 11 what volume of oxygen reacts with 23.6 decimeters cubed of ethane at 574 kelvins and 250 kilopascals now as i said because we're only talking about gases we can ignore the temperature and the pressure so although it mentions temperature and pressure in the question those are kind of a red herring they're more or that, that's more information than you need and it's there just to confuse it can be ignored so this reverts to a simple mole ratio problem so with our mole ratios we identify the species of interest so it says what volume of, ox of oxygen so we've got oxygen there O2 reacts with 23.6 decimeters cubed of ethane so that's an ethane so that there is our ethane so the carbon dioxide there and the water there can be ignored okay so we're only looking at gases therefore the temperature and pressure can be ignored so set up the mole ratio problem so remember our data goes on the top so it says 23.6 decimeters cubed of ethane so we're going to say 23.6 there we don't know the volume of oxygen because it says what volume of oxygen so that's just going to be x so that's the data on the top the mole ratio goes on the bottom so there are seven o2s so we're going to have over seven there are two ethanes so over two I just put a little equal sign in there to um, set up the problem or can finish setting up the problem and now we solve for x so we can just say x equals 23.6 divided by 2 times by 7 because that 7 just goes up there and that will come to 82.6 decimeters cubed okay now we could if we wanted we could have gone the whole sort of kit and caboodle and gone PV equals NRT and done that equation for both ethane and uh, oxygen and whatever and worked out the whole thing but actually all the maths works out because we've got the same temperature and the same pressure we don't need to do all that and we can just treat the volume as being equivalent to the number of moles so calculating reacting quantities in which one of the quantities is a mass of something and the other is a volume of gas this is the first of the sort of general types of problems we're going to get in this uh, unit where we um, have mixed quantities and we're going to use the same general method for all of them we're going to start off by converting something into a value in moles then we're going to do a mole ratio problem and then we're going to which will calculate another number of moles for us and we'll, co we'll convert that new number of moles back into some other quantity in this case we're going to start with a mass of pentane convert it into a number of moles of hydrogen and then convert the number of moles of hydrogen into the volume that takes up so let's look at this problem so it says what volume of hydrogen h2 
That is our unknown, because it's saying what volume. So that is our X. It's required to produce 3.60 grams of pentane, C5H12, assuming 100% yield at 194 degrees Celsius. Now, it doesn't mention the, um, the pressure, so we can assume it's standard pressure, which is 100 kilopascals. So let's start trying to solve this. Now, it says we've got 3.60 grams of pentane. So from that, we can work out a number of moles. So again, so the number of moles of pentane, N of C5H12, equals mass, little m, over molar mass, capital M. Now, we don't know the molar mass, so we're going to have to find that now. So let's put that over here, molar mass, capital M, of C5H12, equals 12 times carbon. No, it doesn't. I'm lying to you. Don't believe a word I say. Equals 5 times carbon plus 12 times hydrogen. That's from the formula. Okay. Carbon has a mass of 12, so we're going to say 5 times 12. Hydrogen obviously has a mass of 1, so 12 times 1. And that comes to 72 grams per mole. So then we can stick that into the equation here. So the number of moles of pentane is mass over molar mass. So 3.60 grams from the question divided by divided by 72 grams per mole that we just worked out so divide that by uh, 72 and we get 0 0.05 moles of pentane so that is the first bit done second bit we need to do is to set up our mole ratio problem uh, this bit here so it's quite a simple one because we've just got one mole of each of our relevant substances, but we're going to do it properly anyway, just because it's good practice. So we're going to say, remember, H2 is our X. So we're going to say X over 1, because that is the number of moles of hydrogen in the equation, equals, remember, we just found out that we had 0 0.05 moles of pentane. So it's going to be 0 0.05 over 1. Therefore, if we solve for x, we can cross those out. Uh, x is going to equal 0 0.05 moles of H2. The final step then is, now we've, now we've done our mole ratio problem, the final step is to convert that mole ratio into, or the number of moles of hydrogen rather, into the volume of hydrogen, because that's mentioned up here. So remember we've got the ideal gas equation. So PV equals N. RT. That rearranges then to say V equals NRT over P. So let's look at that volume of H2 equals N, the number of moles of hydrogen, 0 0.05, so 0 0.05, times by the gas constant, 8.31, times by the temperature. Now remember, temperature has to be in Kelvin. We've got 194 there. So to turn that into Kelvin, we're going to do 194 plus 273. And then we're going to divide that whole thing by our pressure, which is 100 kilopascals. And if we stick that into the calculator, we come to an answer of, uh, which comes to uh, 1.94 decimeters cubed. Now, it's just worth reinforcing the point that because the pressure is given in kilopascals, we will be given the volume in decimeters cubed, and we don't need to convert it into meters cubed or into pascals. Uh, those two units work together nicely. Okay, so just to recap the method, we start with our mass, and we convert that into moles first. Then, once we've got some moles, we do our mole ratio problem. And then, once we've got a new number of moles, we convert back into whatever quantity we're trying to find. Well, back to the one that was about measuring the molar volume of the gas. Um, and it starts off by placing a boiling tube on a balance and tearing it. That means pressing the zero button, so the balance now reads zero. Then we're going to add approximately 0 0.05 grams of calcium carbonate powder and accurately weigh it. What that means is it doesn't need to be exactly 0 0.05, but whatever the mass is, we need to know it exactly. We're going to set up a gas syringe with a delivery tube and a bung and clamp it in place on a clamp stand. So here's our delivery tube. And here's our bung. And then we're going to measure out 30 centimetres cubed of ethanoic acid. Okay. Now, ethanoic acid um, is a weak acid. So that's going to react much more slowly. 
which means the gas will be made more slowly and we're not going to lose so much as we um, you know, spend time putting the bung securely in place. Then we're going to pour the acid into the boiling tube and immediately place the bung on its neck and then record the volume of gas collected once the reaction is finished. Then we're going to repeat that six more times, increasing the mass by 0 0.05 grams each time. Now what we need to do then is to calculate the number of moles of calcium carbonate used uh, each time. Remember, we can do that using the equation number of moles equals mass over molar mass. Um, and then we're going to use a mole ratio problem to work out the number of moles of carbon dioxide. Now, the moles of carbon dioxide of calcium carbonate in this equation is C8, when this reaction is CaCO3 to um, CO2 is 1 to 1. So whatever your number of moles of calcium carbonate you work out each time is going to be also the number of moles of carbon dioxide. Then what we can do is draw a graph of the volume of gas um, so the versus the number of moles of carbon dioxide. So we've got volume of gas on the y-axis, we've got the number of moles of carbon on the x-axis, and we're going to draw a line of estimate, and that's important because you'll find your data you know, will look a little bit like this. It won't exactly fit the pattern, so we need the line of best fit to you know, pull out the pattern in the data. And then what you're going to do is, using your graph, you're going to determine the number of moles of carbon when the volume is 25 centimetres cubed and so you're going to go along on your graph so you hit the line and then down to read off the number of moles and then using that you can calculate the molar volume um, so the molar volume V is going to be the um, volume divided by the number of moles that's the equation you're going to use for that and the reason we do it this way is because if we get the graph to sort of see the overall pattern, it means we can draw the line of best fit and that, that means we don't need to worry so much about each individual result being not 100% accurate because we still get the overall pattern and it's the pattern, the trend line, is what we're going to use to do our calculations. The concentration of the solution. So when we're talking about concentration, we mean the amount of solute dissolved in a given volume of the overall solution. Um, so in very simple terms, you know, you might say it's the strength of the solution. This should be no big surprise. This is all kind of GCSE level stuff. Um, in my very simple and highly non-scientific Ribena model of concentration, um, this would have very low concentration. This would have very high concentration. To make up this weak Ribena, there might only be a very small amount of Ribena dissolved in our glassful and to make up this strong ribena there'd be a lot more um, ribena a lot more of our solute dissolved in the glass um, so in terms of measuring concentration there are two different ways to look at it we can think of it in terms of the molar concentration and the mass concentration the molar concentration is the quantity of solute in moles dissolved in each decimeter cubed of solution Okay, so decimeter cubed um, is this thing, TM3, that is one litre in perhaps more familiar language. Okay, now importantly, this isn't saying that, you know, to make a one molar solution, you'll get one mole of stuff and dissolve it in one litre of solvent. It's more that you get one mole of your solute and you add enough solvent to make it up to one litre. Um, don't forget that the solute will take up some space, so actually you normally are adding slightly less than one litre of the actual solvent. Um, we've also got the mass concentration, which is the quantity of solute in grams dissolved in each centimetre cubed of solution, uh, decimetre cubed of solution rather. Now, um, in terms of units for molar concentration, we've got moles per decimetre cubed, um, mole dm to the minus three, but that stands for moles per decimetre cubed. Um, you might sometimes see this as abbreviated to just capital M. So, for example, if a, if you saw a bottle labelled, I don't know, 1.0 M, that means 1.0 moles per decimeter cubed. And the units for mass concentration are grams per decimeter cubed, G dm to the minus three, like that. Now these um, are just these diagrams, are just looking at what we mean by concentration. So, for example, in the two boxes, the concentration of blue particles are the same because you've got the same number of particles in the um, same amount of space. In the uh, the red particles, uh, it should be clear. 
are less concentrated in the left box and more concentrated in the right box because there are more of them. Um, here, we've still got differences in concentration because if you remember, concentration involves not just the amount of solute, but also the volume uh, it's in. So although all of these all of these boxes here have got um, seven green particles, it's most concentrated here because they're in the smallest volume. So remember, concentration takes account of both the number of particles and the volume that they are occupying. So we need to do some calculations um, with uh, concentration. And we need to be able to calculate concentrations both in terms of the mass concentration and the um, molar concentration. So let's start with mass. Um, really easy calculation it is just the concentration equals the quantity in grams divided by the volume in decimeters cubed and we've got this equation here c capital c for concentration equals m for mass divided by v for volume how does that work in practice example 13 the concentration of sodium chloride in seawater is 35.0 grams per decimeter cubed so sodium chloride is 35.0 grams per decimeter cubed what volume of seawater would you need to be evaporated to produce 1.0 kilograms of sodium chloride. So we are being given a concentration and we're being asked to find um, a mass, so um, to find a volume rather, here's our volume. So we need to rearrange our equation, m equals uh, c equals m over v to make v the subject. So if c equals m over v, then we're gonna just swap places like this and end up with um, v equals m over c. So in this case, our mass is one kilogram. One kilogram, we need to convert into grams. So we're going to multiply by a thousand, so that obviously equals 1,000 grams. So we're going to do equals 1,000 grams over our concentration, 35. And if we stick that into the calculator, we're going to come to an answer of 28.6 decimeters cubed. Now note that I'm giving an answer to three significant figures because the values in my question are given to three significant figures, 1.00 and 35.0. So you need to try and make sure that your accuracy matches the accuracy of the inputs that you're putting into your calculations. So molar concentration equals quantity in moles divided by volume in decimeters cubed. Um, if we look at the symbol equation, we get capital C equals the concentration equals N divided by V. N is moles, V is volume. So let's look at a practice problem with this. What mass of potassium hydroxide must be dissolved in 40 centimeters cubed of water to produce a solution with a concentration of 0 0.75 moles per decimeter cubed? Let's just do a bit of housekeeping first. Are we using potassium hydroxide? So we just need to know that its formula is KOH. If you don't know that now, you will by the end of the course, I hope. If not, good luck. Um, also note that we've got a volume here in centimetres cubed. We need it in decimetres cubed. So if we divide that by a thousand, we get a volume of 0 0.040 decimetres cubed. Okay. Now, we're being asked to find the mass of potassium hydroxide. We can't find the mass of it unless we know the number of moles we need. So we're going to need to rearrange our equation here to say n equals something. So if c equals n over v, n, which is our number of moles of KOH, equals c times v, which equals 0 0.75 times by our volume, which we just saw was 0 0.040, which equals 0 0.030 moles. Okay. Now note, I'm keeping these zeros at the end just to show that it's two significant figures because my inputs to the calculation are also two significant figures. Now, we know from um, uh, our uh, earlier sums that um, the number of moles of a solid equals mass over molar mass. Therefore, therefore, the mass equals the molar mass times by the number of moles. Okay. 
we've just worked out the number of moles of KOH, that's um, 0 0.030, but we don't know the molar mass of it. So let's work out the molar mass first before we do anything else. So molar mass, capital M, of KOH equals uh, 1 times cal uh, potassium plus 1 times oxygen plus 1 times hydrogen equals 39.1 plus 16 plus 1, which equals 56.1. Um, that's a bad 5. 56.1. So now we've got our um, molar mass, which is 56.1. So that can go into the equation. So 56.1. And we've got our number of moles, 0 0.03. 56.1 times 0 0.03 uh, equals 1.683 but we've only got two significant figures so we're going to need to round so it's going to come to uh, 1.7 grams and that is our final answer okay so the acting quantities uh, involving solutions is going to involve the same strategy that we've um, met on previous slides so we're going to start off by converting something into moles. Then we're going to do our mole ratio problem. And then we're going to convert whatever answer we get from moles into whatever other quantity we need. So let's have a look at this example. In this example, it says, what concentration of sodium hydroxide in a OH solution is formed when five grams of sodium reacts fully with 300 centimeters cubed of water? And it says, assume the volume of solution formed is the same as the initial volume of water. That assumption isn't necessarily true, but it's just there to help simplify the calculation for us. So what do we do? We're going to convert into moles first of all. Now we've got um, sodium and it tells us we've got five grams. So we're going to calculate the number of moles of sodium. So remember N of Na. Remember we always label calculations clearly. Number of moles of sodium equals mass, little m, over molar mass, capital M, equals 5.00 over 23.0, that is the molar mass of sodium from the periodic table. And then um, if we stick that into the calculator, we get an answer of 0 0.2174 moles. So that is step one done. Next thing we need to do is to set up our mole ratio problem. So we should be getting used to this by now. What we're going to do is um, remind ourselves that we're trying to find the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. So the sodium hydroxide will be X. And we've already got the number of moles of sodium now, 0.2174. So set up our problem. We're going to say 0.2174 over 2 equals x over 2 because there are two sodium hydroxides um, and in this one we can see that both those twos cancel so clearly um, uh, x equals 0.2174 moles of NaOH now it's always worth just adding in these extra little bits of labeling just so it's always really clear exactly what all your numbers mean so the last thing we need to do now then is to, because uh, we've done the mole ratio problem, the last thing to do is to convert from a number of moles back into whatever we're being asked. In this case, we're being asked to find the concentration of sodium hydroxide solution that is formed. So let's have a look at that. Um, so you want to say C for concentration of NaOH in brackets uh, equals the quantity in moles divided by the volume. So N over V. Now just note that our volume here is in centimetres cubed and we need it in decimetres cubed. So we're going to say volume equals 300. We divide by 1000 to convert to decimetres cubed, which equals 0 0.300 decimetres cubed. So we're going to use that volume. Um, so we're dividing by the three, sorry, we're dividing by the 0.3 that we just found, that one there. 
and our number of moles we saw up here was um, uh, 0.2174 and if we work that calculation through we end up with a uh, concentration of 0 0.725 moles per decimeter cubed rounded to three significant figures because all of the inputs are in three significant figures and that is our calculation completed so a reminder we converted the mass of sodium into moles first then we did a mole ratio problem so that was the conversion to moles this was our mole ratio problem and then we converted from moles into the quantity we were asked for standard solutions a standard solution is a solution whose concentration is known very accurately um, and these things are essential for any kind of quantitative analysis what I mean by quantitative analysis is finding out the concentration of you know some kind of solution that we've just made or something we're interested in where we don't know its concentration we can use a standard solution to find it out but for the answer to be accurate we must know the concentration of the standard solution very accurately first so we have to prepare them, prepare them very carefully. So we start off by weighing the solute uh, and weighing it accurately. Then we have to transfer the solute into a volumetric flask. A volumetric flask is one of these here with a sort of the rounded bottom and the long thin neck. And importantly, um, you have to make sure that all of the solute gets transferred to the volumetric flask. And you, you would do that something like this. So you want to try to try and sort of minimize opportunities to lose any of your solid that you're weighing out. So you'd 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 have your balance, so your your um, beaker uh, on the balance, and you'd set it to zero. Then you'd add the um, solute directly into the beaker. Then once you weighed it out and recorded the mass, you'll add some liquid and stir it until it dissolves, and then you'd pour it into uh, your volumetric flask. But importantly, what you'd do then is once you'd poured the um, solution into the volumetric flask you would rinse it out with a load of water and pour that into the volumetric flask and do that two or three times so that you can be sure that every single last bit of solute has gone into the volumetric flask then you carefully make the volumetric flask up to the right mark um, we'll talk about this on in a couple of slides time but there's a little calibration mark halfway up the neck and you have to add the water up to that level and at that point you know that you've um, you've got exactly the right volume now this method only works if you're using a solute that is very pure and you're using using something that doesn't react with air so you don't want some kind of some kind of substance that would gain or lose mass when it was exposed to the air because then you, you wouldn't know how much you had and also it works better for substances with a high molar mass because that means that there is a, a lower percentage error when you are weighing things Diluting solutions. So often when you make a solution, you're going to need to dilute it down to the concentration uh, that you actually need. So why might you do this? It might be because you've got a standard solution that is too concentrated and you need to dilute it down to something that is more appropriate for the experiment. It might be you've got some kind of unknown solution that you've prepared. And again, it needs to be diluted down to make it more suitable to analyze. Maybe it's got a color that's too strong to see uh, clearly or something like that. So how do you do this? Um, first thing you do is you accurately measure a volume of the solution that you want to dilute using a pipette okay and a pipette filler as well now a pipette is not one of those little squeezy plastic things it is a glass instrument um, like these two things here now pipettes are used to measure volumes of liquids very accurately and broadly speaking there are two types so this first one is an example of a bulb pipette um, and you've got the pipette filler here and using the pipette filler, you suck solution all the way up the bulb pipette until you get to the graduation mark, which might be wherever it is. And uh, that would measure out one volume very clearly. For example, this one is a 25 centimeter cubed bulb pipette. So it can measure out 25 centimeters cubed very accurately, but, but no other quantity. Um, called a bulb pipette because it's got this bulb shape there. There are also these pipettes here which are called graduated pipettes these are a bit like a very accurate measuring cylinder because they've got these graduation marks uh, all out the side 
so that you can measure out an exactly yeah, a range of different volumes um, uh, but very accurately. Once you've done that you will transfer the contents of your pipette into a volumetric flask and you do that by pressing this little button on the side here and when you do that you'll find that as all the liquid runs out it just leaves a few little droplets in the bottom like that okay do not worry about these droplets that get left get left behind the pipette is calibrated to take to take to take account of those so there's no point trying to get them out and if you do actually your results will be less accurate then once the stuff is in the volumetric flask you'll fill the volumetric flask up uh, with water up to the calibration mark now volumetric flasks have a little line about halfway up the neck and that is when the volume is what it says so for example this volumetric flask it says the volume is a thousand millilitres thousand centimetres cubed but it's only that when the water is up to the calibration mark now you need to read these properly so if you look at the water carefully or well, the solution carefully you'll see that it's got this little dip like that okay this little upside down dip that is called the meniscus and it is only measured the volume accurately when the bottom of the meniscus is exactly in line with the um, uh, calibration mark now on to dilution calculations the total number of moles of a substance before and after a solution is diluted must be the same so this is really useful because it lets us calculate dilutions in a sort of shorthand way so we don't need to bother going all the way through moles and stuff so we're going to use this equation here which is c1v1 equals c2v2 concentration one times volume one equals concentration two times volume two what does this mean in practice let's look at example 14. a chemist has 250 centimeters cubed of a 0.5 mole per decimeter cubed solution of sulfuric acid h2so4 what volume of the solution should she use to produce a thousand uh, sorry 100 centimeters cubed of a 0.2 mole per decimeter cube solution so first things first we've actually got too much information here um, so uh, we've got 100 centimeters cubed of 0.2 mole per decimeter cube solution so that is kind of our target that is our c2 and our v2 so we're going to have something so if we put c2 and v2 there c1 v1 our c2 and v2 are the 0.2 moles per decimeter cubed that is our c2 and our v2 is this 100 here okay now we are trying to find a volume so it's volume that we uh, don't know so we're just going to leave that as v1 but constant the concentration the initial concentration of the solution is here 0.5 moles per decimeter cubed so we're going to have 0.5 there now note this 250 is not going to be used that is just kind of surplus information and questions will do this sometimes it's important that you can select and identify which information is relevant and which isn't and this is not relevant so we are going to ignore it so now we've got this calculation that says 0 0.500 times v1 equals 0 0.200 times 100 so a fairly simple rearrangement we're going to say v1 equals 0 0.200 times 100 over um, uh, 0 0.500 and if we um, crunch that through we get to an answer of v1 being 40 centimeters cubed principles of titration titration is a technique that is often used to use the accurately known concentration of one solution to determine to determine the unknown concentration of a second solution uh, and it works like this so normally we have our unknown solution uh, in the um, in a conical flask like this okay and we have our known solution in the burette and what we do is we add solution the known solution from the burette to the conical flask until we see some kind of change happen um, at which point we close the burette and we measure uh, we record what volume of liquid has been added now we call that point when we see our noticeable change we call that the end point of the reaction okay 
Um, and that's when you stop adding the titrant um, from the burette. And that's usually, but not always, usually signified by some kind of sharp, sudden colour change. Okay. Now this works on the basis that um, our reactants react in a given ratio. So for example, in the equation below, um, it might be that A is our, is our known that is in the burette, and it might be that B is our unknown that is um, in the conical flask. Now, if we know the concentration and the volume of our known substance, and we work that out from the titration, then that tells us the number of moles of A that we've added. And because they react in a given ratio, we can then work out the number of moles of B that we must have had. And we can use that to determine the concentration of our unknown substance. Now, when we talk about titrations, we often talk about the equivalence point. Um, this is the point, at, so the equivalence point is the point at which the exact amount of titrant required by the balanced equation has been added. So in the case of, uh, of our reaction up here, the equivalence point would happen at the point where the number of moles of A is exactly half of the number of moles of B. Um, and at that point, we've added stoichiometrically equal amounts of each and so that is the equivalence point and normally if we choose our um, indicator correctly then we'll find that the equivalence point and the end point are the same point now why would we do titration we do it for a couple of reasons the first one is to analyze solutions to determine their concentration okay and that happens for all sorts of things um, uh, you know, we might be using the concentration of something to monitor the rate of a reaction. It might be we um, are using it to find the quantity of some substance that's in a medication. Um, there could be all sorts of things that involve require us to find the concentration of a solution. The other thing we can do is use it to determine the coefficients of an equation. Um, so these numbers here, the the one and the two, they can actually be found out using titrations as well because of the way things reliably react in the same ratio. So in practice, there's quite a few bits and pieces we need to get our head around when we uh, when we look at the kind of techniques of titration. The first thing is we need to know how to use the burette properly. Now you'll notice at the bottom of the burette is this tap here, and you need to be able to um, be really skillful using that so that you can reliably add a single drop of titrant when you want to. Now I think the best way to achieve that is to use two hands on the tap um, and really use one hand to steady the tap and the other hand kind of braced against it um, to very, very slowly turn the tap and practice doing that so you can get, as I say, just a single drop of titrant out at a time. Um, another important thing is to have a white tile underneath your conical flask um, so that you've got a really good clear colour contrast because although you should have a really sharp colour change, sometimes it's not so clear and you want to make sure that you know, the colour of your bench or the colour of something else isn't distracting your eye from the colours you're trying to look at. Next, we've got um, how you read the burette. Now, you need to make sure that your eyes are level okay, with the level of the liquid in the burette when you're taking your reading. Okay. If you don't do that, if you're looking down towards the level or up towards the level, you get something called the parallax effect. The parallax effect is the way that, you know, when you look at you know something in front of you, the background and the foreground appear to move at different speeds. Now, that parallax effect can mean that you read a burette inaccurately if your eyes are not level with it, okay? Secondly, make sure there's a white sheet behind the burette so that you've got a good color contrast. Because again, you're looking for the meniscus, okay? Remember, that's the curved layer there and you're looking to have things in line with the meniscus. Now that meniscus isn't always easy to see. So if you've got a white sheet behind you, the contrast is clearer and you can re more reliably take your reading. And the last thing is to make sure you read to the nearest 0.5 centimeters cubed. So 0.05 centimeters cubed. So that is half of a graduation. So if we look at my, my little red graduations here, you need to judge whether it is exactly in line with one or if it is halfway between, okay? And so record to 0 0.00 or 0 0.05. That's the level of accuracy you should be able to get with the burette. 
And lastly, we need to make sure that we get reliable results. Um, what we're looking for is what we call two concordant titers. Okay, that is two values that are within 0 0.1 centimeters cubed of each other. Now, when you first start doing titrations, that can seem like an impossible challenge, but it's very realistic provided you do this. So the first thing is to do, start off doing a rough titration to get an approximate idea of the end point. And by a rough titration, I mean, you've got your tap open um, almost fully and the liquid is flowing through very, very quickly. Um, and you're swirling it the whole time. And as soon as the end point happens, you stop. OK. And you record your kind of rough titer. Then you perform accurate titrations. Now, to perform your accurate titration, you very quickly run the solution, uh, the titrant into conical flask until you're within about two centimeters cubed of the end point, and then you stop. Then you adjust the tap. So the flow rate is roughly one drop every three seconds. And to, to adjust that tap clear, um, properly, again, make sure you're using two hands on the tap. That's, that way you can get the smallest kind of movements and adjust it most finely. Okay. Um, so you're adjusting the flow rate to roughly one drop every three seconds while swirling continuously. And you'll find when you're near the end point that the colour change starts to happen. You'll find maybe the colour changes, you swirl it a bit and it kind of goes back. So you'll get a feel for um, when the colour is about to change. And at that point, what you do is you add, adjust the tap again and add a single drop at a time. Add a drop, swirl it thoroughly, see what happens. Add another drop, swirl it thoroughly, see what happens. And if you do that, um, you'll be able to record a reliable result. And then what you do is you repeat that until you get two, as I say, concordant ones. That's within 0 0.1 of each other. They'll either be the same or they'll be 0 0.1 different. And your result that you use will be the average of those two answers. Titration calculations. If we combine the equation to calculate the number of moles uh, present in a solution, that is number of moles equals concentration times volume. Okay, And then we combine that with the idea of mole ratios. So we divide the number of moles by the number of the substances in the equation. We can end up with an equation that looks like this, where we say C1 V1 over N1 equals C2 V2 over N2. And this equation is going to be used to help us solve um, titration calculations. So what does this look like in practice? Let's look at an example. So it says a solution of Fe2 plus ions of unknown concentration was titrated with 0 0.0100 mole per decimeter cube solution of manganate 7 ions, MnO4 minus. Determine the concentration of Fe2 plus ions if 25 centimeters cubed of Fe2 plus solution uh, required the addition of 17.6 centimeters cubed of the manganate 7 solution. Fe2 plus ions and manganate 7 ions react according to the following equation. So there's a lot to take in there, but first of all, we're looking at Fe2 plus ions and um, manganate ions. So let's just underline those things so we know what to focus on. So we've got the Fe2 plus there and the manganate there. So we can ignore everything else in the equation. You don't have to scrub it out, but it can feel cathartic to do it. So let's just kind of get rid and focus just on our Fe2 plus and our MnO4 minus. Now, we're going to set one of these things as the ones and one of them as the twos. It does not matter which way around you do it. But I find it tends to make more sense if the unknown thing is your ones. Now, in this question, it says that the Fe2 plus ions have the unknown concentration. So let's make Fe2 plus our ones. So I'm going to put a little one there to remind me of that. And then the MnO4s will be our twos. So let's see how this equation works. So we say C1V1 over N1 equals C2V2 over N2. So C1V1 over N1 equals C2V2 over N2. Now, C1 is the concentration of, of Fe2+. Plus. Now, we don't know it, so we're just going to leave it as C1. So we're going to say C1 times... V1. Now the volume of Fe2 plus ions we're talking about, it says determine the concentration of Fe2 plus ions if 25 centimeters cubed of Fe2 plus, so that is 25. Okay. 
and n1 is the number of those in the equation. So there are five Fe2 pluses in the equation, so we're going to divide that by five equals C2. So C2 is the concentration of MnO4. So it says in the question that the MnO4 had a concentration of 0 0.0100 moles per centimeter cubed. So we're going to say 0 0.0100 times by the volume. Now the volume, volume two of manganate is our titer, our titration amount which is written here. It says 17.6 centimeters cubed of the manganate solution. So we're going to do that times 17.6. And we're going to divide that by the number of manganate ions in the equation, which is, well, there's no number there, so that's a one. Okay. So we can rearrange that to say that C1 equals 0 0.0100 times 17. 0.6 times 5 divided by 25 times 1. So we're putting the 25s down and the 5 up to rearrange that equation. Uh, and if we work that all out, that is going to come to the concentration equals 0 0.352 moles per decimeter cubed. So just to recap, the equation we're going to use is this one, C1B1 over N1 equals C2B2 over N2. And I think the most important step uh, is just to make sure you label which species is your one and which is your two, because that just helps you to be really clear in your head which numbers are going where. Now, acid-base titrations. Um, when we do acid-base titrations, we will use a coloured indicator to determine the end point. So an indicator is obviously a coloured substance that changes colour depending on the pH. And you've met indicators before like phenolphthalein and methyl orange and, and universal indicator. Um, but we need to know a little bit more depth than that. So we've got a whole range of different indicators that you might need to choose from. And you can see those indicators here. Okay. Now what you can also see is that they've all got a series of they've all got a range of different colour changes. So you know um, Bromophenol blue, for example, goes from yellow to blue via a sort of intermediate greeny stage. Okay. But also notice that they change colour at different pHs. So we've got methyl orange, which changes colour around pH 3 or 4. Whereas we've got thy thymol thaline, which changes colour around pH 10 or 11. Okay. And so you need to be able to choose the titration. Uh, sorry, the indicator based on the uh, combination of acid and alkali that we're titrating with. So first of all, if you remember from, from um, GCC, we've got strong acids and weak acids. Okay, So strong acids, they fully dissociate to form ions, uh, as do strong bases. So if we are reacting a strong acid with a strong base, what we'll find is the pH changes very rapidly between pH 3 and pH 10. So any indicator that changes pH in that range will be suitable to use. So if we look again at our list here, we probably kind of the kind of indicator we're talking about, I wouldn't say Congo red, but I'd say bromocreosol. So a bromocreosol green, anything there, anything kind of any of those four I would suggest are a good option because they're all changing their color within this pH 3 to 10 range. Now, we've also met before the idea of weak acids. Weak acids do not fully dissociate to form ions. Um, and what that means is that their pH changes over a different range as well. So with weak acids and a strong base, we'll find that pH changes between pH 6 and 10. Okay. So in this example, if we use, for example, pH 3, that would be changing colour well before we've got to our kind of neutralisation point. Whereas um, uh, what we need to do now then is choose something that changes colour at a later pH. So something like sort of any of these three are probably going to change colour in the right kind of range for us now. Okay. So in order to choose your um, indicator, you just need to ask yourself, 
what's my combination of acid and base? If it is a strong acid and a strong base, we're looking for things changing the range pH 3 to 10. If it's a weak acid and a strong base, we're looking for the range pH 6 to pH 10. We will learn a lot more about the difference between strong and weak acids and indicators uh, when we come on to the uh, year 13 part of the course. Acid-base titration calculations. Um, these work the same as for other titration calculations, but they might be a bit more involved because we might need to do determine the equation first. And we might need to work out concentration in grams per decimeter cubed, as well as just moles per decimeter cubed. So the core of it is going to be the same, but the core of the calculation will be the C1, V1 over N1 equals C2, V2 over N2. So let's have a look at this example, 17. So five centimeters cubed, of a solution of potassium carbonate K2CO3 was titrated with 0.5 mole per decimeter cubed hydrochloric acid HCl to juice the equation for the reaction and hence determine the concentration of potassium carbonate in both moles per decimeter cubed and grams per decimeter cubed if the average titer was 13.1 centimeters cubed. So let's start with the equation. Now the reaction of carbonates with acids is one of the ones you need to know from GCSE and we'll look at it in more detail later in the A-level course as well. But if we start with our reactants K2CO3 plus HCl makes, you should know that a carbonate and acid makes salt. In this case, the salt will be KCl, that is the metal from our base and the anion from our acid. So KCl plus water, H2O, plus um, carbon dioxide. So balance it up, there's two potassiums. So we're gonna have two potassiums here, two potassium chlorides rather. Um, now there's two chlorides, so we'll need two um, HCLs. We've got two waters, so um, two hydrogens rather, so that means we need two hydrogens there, which we've got. We've got one, two, three oxygens, one, two, three oxygens, so all is balanced. Right, now, we said before that it helps to decide what is your one and what is your two when you're doing the C1V1 over N1 equation. Okay, so it's easiest if your unknown is one. Now the unknown is your concentration of potassium carbonate. So let's make potassium carbonate our ones and the HCl our twos. Okay, so we're going to write out our equation now. C1 V1 over N1 equals C2 V2 over N2. Now the concentration of potassium carbonate we don't know, so we're going to leave it as C1. The volume though we do know, it says is five centimeters cubed. So we're going to say C1 times five, 5.00, 5 make sure you keep that accuracy. Divided by N1, the number of potassium carbonates in the equation is just one. And that equals C2. So the concentration of hydrochloric acid is 0 0.05, so not 0 0.05, 0 0.5, 0, 0. Again, make sure you keep the accuracy. Times the volume. The volume is the titer, which is here, 13.10. So times 13.10. Divide that by the number of hydrochloric acids in the equation, which is two. So divide that by two. Then if we rearrange that, we get C1, C1 equals 0 0.500 times 13.10 times by one, because the one comes up. Don't really need to do that, but it just, you know, it's neater if we do. Divide it by five, because the five goes down. So we're dividing it by two times five, okay? And if we do that, we come to an answer of 0 0.655 moles per decimeter cubed. So that is our molar concentration. We also need a mass concentration. So to do that, we're going to need to just multiply our molar concentration by the molar mass. So we're going to say M um, of K2CO3 
M of K two C O three equals two times K plus C plus three times O, which equals which equals two times thirty nine point one for carbon plus twelve for um so thirty nine point one for potassium plus twelve for carbon plus three lots of 16 for oxygen that comes to um, 138.2 grams per mole and then finally the concentration of potassium carbonate will just equal the molar concentration 0 0.655 times by the mass concentration 138.2 and that comes to uh, 90.5 uh, grams, not per mole, that doesn't make sense, uh, grams per decimeter cubed. So again, these calculations aren't particularly different to the ordinary titration calculations. It's just we're being asked to do a little bit more. So we're being asked to work out the um, equation first, and then we're being asked to work out a concentration in grams per decimeter cubed as well as moles per decimeter cubed. Errors in experimental results. Now this word error makes it sound like we're talking about things we do wrong in experimental results, but it's not really that. Um, errors in science, in the scientific word, error means knowing how, how well we know something. For example, let's imagine we measured uh, some kind of amount of energy and it came out to 100 joules. If we talk about error, we say it was 100 joules plus or minus 0.5 joules. Okay. Now this is kind of unique to science because what this says is not just what the value is, but how accurately we know that value. And that tells us how much we can trust the value. If you had 100 joules to plus or minus 0.5 joules, and you had 150 joules to plus or minus, I don't know, 20 joules or something, because this value has got a much bigger error in it, you would trust it less than this one, which has got a much smaller error. So this is really powerful stuff. And what scientists spend a lot of time doing is designing experiments in such a way as to minimize the size of the error, because the less the size of the error, the more you can trust the result, and the more accurately you know it. And that sort of leads us on to two key words we need to understand. First one is accuracy, which is how close a measured value is to its true value. And, you know, good experimental design will get more and more accurate results. So you can get more accurate results um, by eliminating sources of error, by using more expensive equipment that can measure things more accurately, and so on. Then we have precision. Precision is about when the error in results is small. And you know the error in results is small because repeated results will be close together. Um, that means they are precise. Okay. So, um, one of the you know one of the reasons when we do titrations that we aim for concordant results is because that gives us the degree of precision that suggests we can trust our results. Um, it is worth noting though that precision and accuracy are not the same thing. So our results could be concordant, they could be precise, but they may be precisely wrong. It may be we've made the same error in how we make our readings both times, and so although we've got similar results, they are both wrong. Now. In terms of actually how we quantify and calculate error, there are two different types of errors. There are random errors and systematic errors. Random errors are down to small, unpreventable differences in the reading of instruments. You know, um, although we try to make sure we read a burette at the exact same time every day, you know, it's impossible to control that because we're, we're human and, you know, there, there are always just slight, small factors that make these slight differences. You know, let's imagine you're doing a titration where you have to stop uh, when there's a particular colour change you don't always judge the colour change in the exact same way every single time. And so that leads to these these small, ran, uh, sort of unpreventable differences that build up to create this random error in experiments. Um, there is nothing we can do to eliminate random error, but we can make it smaller by careful experimental design. We then also have systematic error. Now, systematic error is due to errors in the equipment used. Um, caused firstly by badly calibrated equipment. That's the, that's the first thing. So for example, let's take the idea of this volumetric flask. Now it says it contains 500 millilitres when it is made, when the uh, solution is made up to the 
calibration mark but if you see here we've got the systematic error in it which is plus or minus 0 0.25 centimeters cubed that means when it's full this thing could contain anywhere between 499.75 to 500.25 centimeters cubed and we've got no way of knowing where it is in that range now this is just down to small errors in the way it's manufactured there's nothing you can do to make it exactly 500 there'll always be some error um, but the more expensive the glassware generally the smaller the size of the random sort of the systematic error uh, and the you know the better calibrated it will be so that is um one sort of systematic error the other one is to do with um, taking the readings in the wrong way every time um, one example we've talked about already is the parallax effect so you're supposed to read a measuring cylinder or a burette at eye level um, so you can judge where the meniscus is um, most accurately but if you consistently do it above eye level okay you get this parallax effect where the meniscus can appear to be in a different position to where it really is because you're not looking at it correctly and that will cause if you're looking at it in the same wrong way every time you'll get the same error every time which is you know going to be a systematic error so to summarize understanding our sources of error is super important because if we understand them we can take them into account and that can tell us how or the extent to which we can trust our experimental results now the really important thing about understanding the errors uh, uh, in experimental results is that if we know them we can calculate the extent to which they affect uh, the results that we've got and this is something called error propagation okay now before we can go any further we need to uh, understand that there are two types of uncertainty in experimental results we've talked about sources of error and the idea of random error and systematic error and what those lead to is uncertainty in our calculated results now we can talk about absolute uncertainty and percentage uncertainty okay now absolute uncertainty is the actual amount of uncertainty in a measured quantity in the units it's measured in so for example uh, a ruler might measure a line as being 10.0 centimeters plus or minus 0.1 centimeters now that plus or minus 0.1 that would be our absolute uncertainty okay now really importantly if you've got something like a burette in a burette you take two readings you take a reading at the start normally zero but it is a reading and you take another reading when you've finished okay and both of those readings both the first one and the second one have the same absolute uncertainty in them that means the total volume here the uncertainty of that will be double the uncertainty of each reading okay so when you uh, when you the sort of the way the error propagates with absolute uncertainty is that uh, you take the uncertainty and multiply it by the number of readings okay because they add together you can reduce absolute uncertainty by using more accurate equipment however this tends to be more expensive so it's not always economical or practical to do that now percentage uncertainty is the size of the uncertainty relative to the size of the result so what we do here to calculate percentage uncertainty is to do our absolute uncertainty divided by the result times by 100 okay now because it's divided by our result the bigger the result or the quantity that we're measuring the smaller the percentage uncertainty because you're dividing by this bigger number which is one of the reasons we always try and make sure in um, in titrations and making up solutions and all sorts of other quantitative things we try and take bigger readings because that reduces our percentage uncertainty now error propagation is the way that these uncertainties that we've calculated go on to affect um, the outcomes of longer calculations that use these as inputs so the basic rule is that if we've got two um, uh, two uncertainties in the same quantity then we will add the absolute uncertainties okay if we're looking at uncertainties with different quantities then we're going to add the percentage uncertainties um, so just to reiterate you add absolute uncertainties for measurements in the same quantity you add percentage uncertainties for measurements 
of different quantities and that will make a little bit more sense as we work through the next couple of examples. So let's start with an example of uh, error propagation in practice and how we can calculate um, errors and then look at how the error affects the maximum and minimum possible values uh, of whatever our calculated result is. So example 18, a titration results in a titer of 12.80 centimeters cubed, just underline that key information. The burette used was accurate to plus or minus 0 0.10 centimeters cubed. Again, underline that key information. Determine the absolute error, percentage error, and maximum and minimum values. Okay, so the absolute error, okay. We've just got to look at the number of readings we take. So with the titration, like we said on the previous slide, you take two result, two measurements. There's one at the beginning where the um, where the uh, uh, the solution starts, and there's another one at the end where it finishes. So you've got two lots of your absolute error of 0 0.1. So we're going to times that by two, and it gives us an absolute error of plus or minus 0 0.20 centimeters cubed in our tighter value. Okay. Now second. We're going to look at our percentage error. Okay, percentage error is your absolute error divided by your result times by 100. So in this case, we've got 0 0.20 divided by 12.80 times by 100. Okay, and that equals 1.56 percent. Okay, so our uh, percentage error is plus or minus 1.56 percent. So what do we do now? How do we calculate these maximum and minimum values? So the maximum value, okay, the maximum value is going to be our initial tighter value, 12.80, times by, in brackets, 100% plus that 1.56% over 100 and that equals 13.0 centimeters cubed and our minimum possible value is going to be again our tighter which is 12.80 times by in brackets 100 minus that 1.56 percent divide the whole thing by 100 okay. and for that we get 12.60 centimeters cubed there. So the outcome of this, it tells us that although our titer was 12.80 centimeters cubed, the actual true value could be anywhere in the range, 12.60 up to 13.0 centimeters cubed. Now for a more complicated error propagation example. Um, so in this one, we've got an experiment where it says a quantity of gas was collected during the experiment and the quantity was found to be 4.86 times 10 to the minus 3 moles using the equation PV, uh, so N equals PV over RT. Calculate the percentage error and the minimum and maximum values for the number of moles in the reaction using the following data. So the data we used was the pressure of 83 kilopascals with a barometer accurate to plus or minus 1.0 kilopascals, a volume of 150 centimetres cubed, the gas syringe accurate to plus or minus 2 centimetres cubed and the temperature was 308 Kelvin with a thermometer accurate to uh, plus or minus 0 0.1 Kelvin. So to do this kind of calculation, because we've got these mixed quantities, we're going to be looking at percentage um, uncertainties for each one. So the percentage uncertainty, remember, is the absolute uncertainty divided by the uh, measured value. So for pressure, the percentage uncertainty for pressure, P, equals... 1.0 divided by 83 times by 100 to make percent, okay, and that comes to 1.205 percent. Note I'm keeping the four significant figures here um, just so I don't lose accuracy by over rounding. Next, we're going to calculate the percentage of uncertainty in the volume. Now, the absolute uncertainty this time although it's plus or minus two for each reading, because with a gas syringe, you're measuring the volume effectively at the start and the end, we're going to have to double that. So we're going to say four over 150 times by 100, and that comes to 2.667%. And finally, 
the percentage of uncertainty in the temperature T equals our um, absolute uncertainty divided by the measured value. So 0 0.1 divided by 308. 0 0.1 divided by 308 times by 100. And that comes to quite a small value. So we're looking at 0.03247%. So now our percentage uncertainty uh, is really easy to calculate. Um, we're just going to um, add together all of our percentage uncertainties for each value. So it's going to be very simply 1.205 plus 2.667 plus 0 0.03247 and that comes to a percentage of uncertainty of 3.904%. And again, note that I'm keeping that four significant figures um, just to make sure I don't lose accuracy by over-rounding. Now lastly, to calculate our maximum and minimum values, the maximum value is going to be our result 4.86 times 10 to the minus 3, so 4.86 times 10 to the minus 3 times by 100 plus our uncertainty 3.904 divided by 100 which equals um, 5. 5 times 10 to the minus 3 moles and our minimum value equals again our measured result okay this time multiplied by 100 minus our error 3.904 and then again divide the whole thing by 100 and that will come to uh, 4.67 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. Okay, so again, now we know that our value isn't necessarily exactly 4.86 times 10 to the minus 3 moles, but it's anywhere in this range 4.67 times 10 to the minus 3 plus 5.05 times 10 to the minus 3. And again, that's the power of this technique because it lets you know not just what the value is, but how certainly we know it. Now, in this example, rather than sort of calculating a particular uncertainty, we're having to have a look at the sort of logic of the way that uncertainties can affect results. Um, so this question, 1.0 a sorry a 1.0 mole potassium cube solution of potassium hydroxide was prepared by dissolving 5.61 grams of potassium hydroxide in 100 centimeters cubed of water. The balance was subsequently found to be incorrectly calibrated, and by titration, the concentration was actually found to be 1.05 moles per centimeter cubed. By how much was the balance over or understating the mass? So, let's just have a look at the logic of this. If the um, if the concentration is actually greater, it means that the mass of potassium hydroxide we used must have been actually more than 5.61 grams. Therefore, the balance must be understating and giving a value that is lower than what was really there. How much lower? Well, let's have a little look. So it was 5.61 grams. So it was claimed to be 5.61 grams, which would have produced a one molar solution, but it actually produced a 1.05 molar solution. So the difference will be the difference in the concentrations multiplied by that mass. Okay, so um, the uh, difference okay, equals the difference in concentrations, 1.05 minus 1.00 times by the original mass, now 5.61, so times by 5.61. And if we do that, we come to uh, a value of 0 0.281 grams. And as we said before, that is 0 0.281 grams under. So the real mass of, um, of our stuff would be 5.61 plus that 0 0.281, okay, which uh, equals um, 
0.891 grams. And you will face these kind of problems in exams where you have to look not just at what the error is, but how you know how that error then subsequently goes on to affect your results and sort of try and reverse engineer things. A really important concept in all of the calculations that we have to do in terms of the quantities of chemicals involved in a reaction is the idea of the limiting reagent. Now the limiting reagent is the one, the reactant that is present in the lowest stoichiometric quantity. Um, a simpler way of saying that is it's the one that's going to run out first because it gets used up first. And we find it by dividing the quantity of each reactant in moles by the coefficients of that reactant in the equation. And it is the limiting reactant that should be used in all future calculations. Any reactant that is not limiting will not run out during the reaction. And we say it is present in excess. Um, and we can, for the most part, ignore it in terms of our calculations. Um, these two points are not quite true when it comes to equilibrium reactions. We can't quite ignore the excess ones, but we won't look at those until we come to the um, year 13 part of the course. So let's see how this works in practice um, with example 21. Now this says what mass in grams of water can be produced by reacting 4.0 grams of H2 with 16.0 grams of O2. Now it says what we need to do is um, divide the quantity in moles of each reactant by the coefficients from the equation. So let's start off looking at H2. So the number of moles of H2 equals the mass over the molar mass. Um, equals um, 4.0, that's our mass. Our molar mass is 2.0. If we just look at that, uh, the molar mass, sorry, molar mass of H2 equals 2 times H equals 2 times 1 equals 2. That shouldn't be a surprise. Okay, and that will come to 2 moles. But once we've got the number of moles, we're going to divide it by the coefficient. So we're now going to do the number of moles of H2 divided by 2 because there were two H2s in the equation. So that is going to be 2 divided by 2 equals 1. Now, next one we've got is we're going to look at oxygen. So O2. Again, same start, we're going to look, calculate the number of moles of H2, so O2 rather, equals mass over molar mass, okay, equals, our mass of oxygen is 16. We need to do our molar mass of oxygen, again, shouldn't be too difficult to know, we should be okay with this by now. The molar mass of O2 equals 2 times O equals 2 times 16 equals 32. So we're going to do 16 divided by 32, and that equals 0 0.50 moles of oxygen, or O2. Um, and then, again, we need to divide the quantity of moles by the coefficient from the equation. So we're going to do N of O2 divide, ooh, that's an equal sign, uh, divided by 1 equals 0 0.50 divided by 1 equals 0 0.50 okay so whichever number whichever of these two answers that one and that one is the smallest is our limiting reactant so in this case what we can say is O2 is limiting because the answer for it is 0 0.5 and for hydrogen it's only uh, and for hydrogen it's 2 so what that means is we need to use the mass of oxygen uh, in our um, further calculations. So if we just think in terms of applying our standard method um, for these problems, we work out the number of moles or we convert into moles, then we do a mole ratio problem, then we convert from moles. So our mo we've, we've got the number of moles here already, that is our 0 0.50 there. So we converted to moles, now we're going to, to do our mole ratio problem. So we're going to say um, 0.50 over 1 equals, and our unknown this time is x, so we're going to say x over 2, um, and that rearranges then to say x equals, sorry, 
eight, x being the number of moles of H2O, x equals 0 0.50 over 1 times 2 equals 1.0. So what we found out now is that in this um, set, in this question, we're going to make 1.0 moles of H2. So remember the third step in our kind of um, reacting quantities calculations is to once we've converted to moles, we've done our mole ratio problem, now we're going to convert from moles because we're trying to find the mass in grams of water. So we're going to say mass of H2O equals the number of moles times by the molar mass equals 1.0 times by times by the molar mass of water, which is 2 times 1 for hydrogen plus 1 times 16 for oxygen and that comes to 18.0 grams and that is how we use the concept of the limiting reactant to work out the um, amount of a, a compound that can be formed in a chemical reaction and just to remind the key idea is that the limiting reactant is the one that is going to run out first same question to yours. So, if 100% of the limiting reactant was converted to product, we would say the yield of the reaction was 100%. Now, in reality, a yield can never be 100%. And this is because um, we lose product in various different ways. One is by the reaction being incomplete. This is particularly caused by the fact that when you get near the end of a reaction, the reactants get get to uh, such low concentrations that the constant that the uh, that the rate of reaction really slows down and so um, you know, it just never actually quite finishes the second thing is that there might be competing side reactions so you might have the reaction that you want taking place but also other unwanted reactions that are robbing some of the yield that you're hoping to produce because the reactants are being used for something else um, there are equilibrium effects you know the idea of reversible reactions which mean that you know, your reaction will just never ever go to completion because some of your products are turning back into reactants. And last one is the loss of materials during transfers. And this is a very practical thing, but you know, you're going to always going to have small amounts of reactant and product getting stuck to the sides of containers, getting stuck in pipettes and so on. Now to calculate percentage yield, we are going to do this very simple calculation. Percentage yield equals actual yield. That's the one that you measure um, after you've made your product. Divided by your theoretical yield, that's the one you calculate and that we have been calculating all the way through this unit then times by 100. So example 22 what is the percentage yield if reacting 5,000 kilograms of iron 3 oxide with 1,000 kilograms of carbon yields 3,000 kilograms of iron and here's the equation for that 2Fe2O3 plus 3C makes 4Fe plus 3CO2. Now before we can do this because we've got two different reactants um, labelled our iron 3 oxide and our carbon we need to do a limiting reactant problem first. So if you remember from the previous slide, for the limiting reactant, we're going to work out the number of moles, then divide by the coefficients in the equation. So let's start with iron uh, oxide. So the number of moles of Fe2O3 equals mass over molar mass. So the mass of iron 3 oxide is 5,000 kilograms. We're going to treat it as grams uh, and not bother converting because um, uh, it doesn't actually matter that the number doesn't matter so long as uh, we use the same units. So we're going to do 5,000 over the molar mass of iron 3 oxide, which is 2 times uh, 55.8 for iron plus 3 times 16 for oxygen. And that comes to uh, 31.32. And then to, in terms of finding whether it's the limiting reactant, we have to divide by the coefficient from the equation, which is 2 down here because there are two Fe2O3s in the equation. So we're going to divide that by 2 and we get 16.66. Um, now for carbon, we're going to do the same thing. So the number of moles of carbon equals mass over molar mass equals 1,000 kilograms. Again, we don't need to convert into kilograms and you know make a million grams. That's, that's fine. We'll just leave it as it is. Divide that by 12 because um, that's the molar mass of carbon, and we'll get 83.33. Then again, we're going to divide by the number or the coefficient in the equation, which this time is 3. So divide by 3, and we'll get 27.78. Now, 16.66 is lower 
than 27.78. So what we can say then is that iron oxide is our limiting reactant and we can ignore the carbon. Now in this question, we're being asked the um, uh, about the yield in terms of iron. So we're going to focus on the iron as well and ignore the carbon dioxide. So we scribble that out. Now, to find the percentage yield, we need to know we, we've got the actual yield. That is that there, our 3,000 kilograms is our actual. But we need to find, calculate the theoretical yield. So we're going to need to do a mole ratio problem using the iron oxide here. Okay. So iron oxide we've got and Fe iron is going to be our unknown X. So let's make that mole ratio problem. Now, when we do the mole ratio problem, we are not going to use that 16.66. We are going to use our number of moles here that we've calculated. So we're going to say 31.32 over 2. That's the coefficient from the equation. Equals x, our unknown number of moles of iron, over 4, the coefficient from the equation. So x equals 31.32 over 2 times 4, which equals 62.64 moles of uh, Fe. So now to find our theoretical yield, okay. We need to know the math. We're going to calculate the mass of Fe. So we're going to say mass of Fe equals number of moles times the molar mass. Sorry, that should be lowercase m. Number of moles times the molar mass equals 62.64 times the molar mass, which is um, 55.8. And that comes to um, 3,000. 495 kilograms. So that is our theoretical yield. Okay, so now we can do our percentage yield calculation. We say percentage yield equals our um, actual yield, which was 3000, over our theoretical, which was 3495, times 100. And that equals 85.8%. Now, 85.8% is actually a pretty good theoretical yield. Um, when I did my degree, I was, I was basically happy if I got anything over 50%. So, uh, well done then. Now, the problem with percentage yield calculations is it focuses too much on the products that we want. And it completely ignores the waste of the products that we don't want. So the idea of atom economy has been developed to try and bring the waste into focus as well. So most reactions produce more than one product and often only one is useful and the others are waste material that gets thrown away. Now sometimes that is harmless waste material which you know, does no damage. Sometimes it's very toxic poisonous waste material that can cause real environmental damage. So focusing on, on sort of the amount of waste is really important if chemists want to be responsible and to reduce their environmental damage. So if we focus on the yield of, that, of the reaction, we ignore that waste and therefore we ignore um, some of the damage that we might be causing as chemists. So what we do instead is consider the atom economy. Now the atom economy is really just a ratio of the molar mass of the desired products to the sum of the molar masses of all of the products and we express it as a percentage like this so what we do is we say the atom economy equals the molar mass of the desired product divided by the sum of the molar masses of all of the products now if the atom economy was 100 percent that would mean that we only got useful products and we didn't produce any waste byproducts and if it was zero percent it means we got none of our desired product and only waste and clearly i hope um, we want to uh, try and get our atom economy to be as close to 100% as possible, although that's very rarely likely to be the case. So let's have a look at this in practice. Example 23, what is the atom economy for the electrolysis of aluminium oxide, that is Al2O3, to produce aluminium, Al? 
Now, in this reaction, our O2 is our waste product and our aluminium is our desired product. So, let's work out the mass of the products first. So, the mass of the product okay, is going to be four times the molar mass of aluminium because there are four aluminiums in the equation which is going to be 4 times 27, which equals 108. Okay. Now, the mass of all of the products okay, is, bear in mind, aluminium is still one of our products, so we're going to think about the aluminium, so that is 108 that we've already got, plus 3 times the molar mass of O2. 108 plus 3 times 2 times 16. Remember, oxygen has a mass of 16, and that comes to 204. So now we're going to do our atom economy calculation. So we're going to say atom economy equals the mass of our product, 108, divided by the mass of all of the products. 204 times by 100 to make it into percent and that gives us an atom economy of 52.9 percent okay so another way of looking at that is saying that if our atom economy is 52.9 percent 47.1 percent of what we put into this reaction uh, is wasted now in this case the waste is oxygen and oxygen is completely harmless gas so this is causing no damage but if that was you know a a toxic substance, a poisonous substance, a carcinogenic substance, this could potentially be quite a hazardous reaction to do. And it might be that the responsible chemist would have to say, no, we're not going to do this. Let's find a better reaction with a better atom economy. Qualitative analysis. Now, all of the um, sort of calculations and analyses that we've done so far have been quantitative analyses that answer questions like, how much of this do I have? What concentration is that? What pressure is this? How much of A can I make from this quantity of B? And so on. Now, qualitative analysis asks a different kind of question rather than a how much question. It asks a what is it question. Um, and this is really important because chemists don't just need to know how much of whatever that they've got. They need to know actually what they have got. You know, you might have designed a reaction to make one thing but unless you've um, done qualitative analysis on it, it might actually be something else entirely. So qualitative analysis tells chemists what they've got. Um, and what it does is, it or what it is rather, it involves performing tests that give specific and easy to observe results only when a particular substance is present. Um, and so when a chemist does one of these tests, they might be looking for a color change, the formation of a precipitate, um, effervescence or bubbling, um, a particular smell being formed, a solid dissolving, a temperature change, any of those kinds of really easy to observe um, changes. And importantly, you want to make sure that change only happens when a particular substance is present, because that way you know for sure that you've got what you hope you've got. A common type of reaction used in qualitative analysis is precipitation reactions. Now, these are reactions in which you, um, when you mix two solutions, you form an insoluble product. Uh, and the main thing you'll see there is that it goes cloudy. Okay, um, And we've got an example here of a precipitate forming. This is lead iodide. Um, the, the bright yellow stuff there is lead iodide formed by mixing a soluble solution of um, lead nitrate with a soluble solution of um, potassium iodide and you get that bright yellow cloudiness formed that's our precipitate so these are used in a few ways uh, one example is the way we test for halide ions with acidified silver nitrate AgNO3 okay and if we have chloride ions present that is Cl minus um, we produce a white precipitate of silver chloride AgCl if we have bromide ions present Br minus we get a cream precipitate um, of 
silver bromide, AgBr. And if we've got iodide ions present, I minus, we produce a pale yellow precipitate of silver iodide. And so the colour of the precipitate is characteristic of the type of halide ion that we have present. Similarly, we can test for sulphate ions by adding a soluble barium salt, um, such as barium chloride or barium nitrate to a solution of sulphate ions. And if we, um, if we have sulphate ions present, then we get this ionic reaction take place where the um, barium two plus ions combine with the sulphate two minus ions to produce insoluble barium sulphate. And we get a very thick, very heavy precipitate of white barium sulphate. Acid base reactions. Now, these are also often used in qualitative analysis. Now, for the most part, the acid or base we use doesn't matter, but the sort of common strong acid to use is hydrochloric acid, and the common strong base to use is sodium hydroxide. So, one example of um, acid base reactions used in qualitative analysis is when we test for carbonate ions, CO3 2 minus, or hydrogen carbonate ions, HCO3 minus, just a carbonate with a hydrogen on and one less charge. Now, if you add a strong acid to one of these solutions, it should bubble, okay? But there are lots of times that you add acid to things and it bubbles. So the bubbling isn't enough on its own. What you have to do then is pass the gas through lime water, which is a solution of calcium hydroxide. And if you do that, the lime water will turn cloudy. So you can see that here. You can see the, the bubbles of gas being passed into the solution. And you can see it getting gradually cloudier and cloudier. Um, demonstrating that the gas was carbon dioxide and therefore we had either a carbonate ion or hydrogen carbonate ions present in solution. Now the reactions to that, if we're looking at carbonate ions, CO3 2 minus, what happens is two acid, two H plus ions, remember H plus ion is the key ion in acids. Um, so CO3 2 minus plus two H plus ions makes H2CO3. Now H2CO3 is uh, carbonic acid. Now, carbonic acid is unstable and instantaneously breaks down, or almost instantaneously, breaks down to produce water and the bubbles of carbon dioxide gas. And that's what you can see bubbling in the um, solution there. We have a similar reaction taking place with um, hydrogen carbonate ions. This time, a hydrogen carbonate ion and one uh, H plus ion react to produce, again, our carbonic acid, which then again breaks down into water. And carbon dioxide. And finally, the test for ammonium ions, which are NH4 plus ions. Now, what we do here is we add a strong base. Remember, sodium hydroxide is our standard strong base that we'll tend to use. Um, and we will warm it over a Bunsen burner. That's what you can see here. Okay. And you'll get a pungent smell produced. Um, and the fumes, the uh, gas that's causing that smell, will turn damp red litmus paper blue. You can see that happening here. The red litmus is turning blue. Now, the reason for this is because when um, ammonium ions, NH4+, plus, react with hydroxide ions, OH-, minus, they produce NH3, which is ammonia, um, which is a gas with a very pungent, very unpleasant smell, really hits the back of your nose, um, and water. And the ammonia, because it's a base, will turn our red litmus paper blue as well. The final type of reactions that we often see in uh, qualitative analysis is redox reactions. These are ones where an oxidation and a rea reduction reaction happen at the same time. Now, common oxidizing agents that we use for this are manganate 7 ions, MnO4 minus, iron 3 ions, Fe3 plus, dichromate ions, or dichromate 6 ions rather, Cr207 2 minus, and ha the halogens, um, chlorine, Cl2, and bromine, Br2. We might also see some reducing agents. And again, common reducing agents are metals in the presence of either an acid or alkali, depending on the metal and depending on the test. Um, sulfur dioxide gas, SO2, and iron 2 ions, Fe2+. So what about some specific examples? Well, iodide ions are a really good example that are often used in qualitative tests. Um, now, iodide ions are colourless, but they turn orangey-brown when they are oxidised to iodine, I2. Now that colour can be a little bit hard to detect, so in the, we often add starch as well because starch in the presence of iodine 
turns a really intense blue black um, and actually we use this to make starch iodide paper um, and this is a really good test for things like chlorine and other oxidizing gases so if we had chlorine and we waved it in uh, or we we waved some uh, damp starch iodide paper in it in front of it it would turn instantly this kind of rich intense blue black and that would demonstrate the presence of chlorine um, we can also use dichromate ions as a uh, in qualitative analysis the dichromate ion is an oxidizing agent as we saw up here okay and when it reacts it gets reduced and that changes its color from orange to green like this okay and this is used as the basis for the sulfur dioxide test so to test for sulfur dioxide we have um, chromate ions cr3 sorry cr207 two minus and three sulfur dioxides plus two acids as well so we need some acid here um, making two cr3 plus ions three sulfate ions so4 two minus so the so2 the sulfur dioxide gets oxidized to sulfate ions so4 two minus plus some water as well in core factor two we'll be preparing a standard solution uh, and then using it to um, find the concentration of an unknown solution of sodium hydroxide. So let's see how this works. So first of all, the solution we're going to prepare is sulfamic acid. And we're going to start off by uh, placing a small beaker on a balance and tearing it. Remember, tearing it is pressing the zero button. Um, then what we do is accurately weigh out approximately 2.5 grams of sulfamic acid. Now, when we say weigh out, accurately weigh out approximately, what that means is it doesn't matter if it's exactly 2.5, but whatever the mass is, we need to make sure we record the mass exactly so we're really clear uh, on exactly what concentration our solution will be in the end. Then we will dissolve the acid in about 100 centimeters cubed of water and transfer that solution to a 250 centimeter cubed volumetric flask. Now, at this point, we don't need to do anything too precisely. But what we do need to make sure is that all of our um, all of our sulfamic acid makes it from the beaker into that volumetric flask. So what that means is we're going to need to repeat uh, the uh, we're going to rinse the beaker in a small amount of water and wash uh, and pour that water into the um, conical flask. And we're going to repeat that three or so times to make sure that every single last bit of um, uh, Sulfamic acid has made it into the volumetric flask. Equally, um, bearing in mind, we'll probably be using a funnel to help with that transfer. We need to make sure that we wash around the edge of the funnel, again, to make sure that no sulfamic acid solution uh, gets left behind in the funnel. And once we've done that, we're going to fill the volumetric flask up to the graduation mark. Now, my advice is to go fairly quickly until about there, and then use a pipette, a, a, a teat pipette, afterwards to go a drop at a time until the meniscus is exactly level with the calibration mark. Now, if you go a single drop over, your solution is no longer of a known volume. And so you will have to start again, which is why I advise using the teat pipette. So fill the volumetric flask up. And what you should do at that point also, once you've, once you've done it, is put the lid on and then invert the solution three or four times. Don't shake it, just invert the solution three or four times to make sure it's thoroughly mixed. You may find at that point that your volume has actually dropped a little bit. If that is the case, then make it back up to the mark again and um, reinvert it again. The reason for that is because when we mix solutions, often the volume goes down slightly because the attractive forces pull all the molecules a little bit closer together. Um, and so now, we, uh, step eight is to calculate the concentration of the solution in moles per decimeter cubed. That's why it's so important to know exactly uh, what the mass of sulfamic acid that we added is. And then what we're going to do, now we know the concentration of our sulfamic acid solution, is we're going to use it to determine the concentration of an unknown solution of sodium hydroxide by titrating it with a methyl orange indicator. I'm not going to go into detail on the titration, but do remember that you need to do a rough titration and then um, repeat repeat it with accurate titrations until you get two concordant results. That means two results within 0.1 millilitres of each other. And just to show you what methyl orange uh, indicator looks like, um, when it's in sodium hydroxide, it is this yellow colour. And we need to stop the titration 
when it is in its neutral form, which is orange. If you go far enough to make it red, you have gone too far and will need to repeat your titration. Four back for three. Finding the concentration of a solution of hydrochloric acid. Now, as well as um, using a, our titration skills here, we're also going to practice diluting a uh, solution, and that's the thing we start with. So we're going to wash out a volumetric, a 250 cube volumetric flask with distilled water. That's to make sure that um, anything that might interfere with the results dissolves and gets washed away. Um, then we're going to transfer 250 centimeters cubed of an unknown solution of hydrochloric acid into the volumetric flask using a bulb pipette. And when we use that bulb pipette, we're going to make sure we're paying close attention to the meniscus and making sure the bottom of the meniscus is on the graduation mark. Um, and then we're going to transfer that into our volumetric flask. What we're then going to do is add distilled water up to the calibration mark. Okay, and the calibration mark is that line there. Now, like with the last practical, we're going to go quickly, uh, fill, fill up quickly until about that point, and then to fill the remainder of the uh, volumetric flask, we're going to use our teat pipette. And that is so we can add a liquid one drop at a time, because remember, if we go a single drop over, we've you know no longer got the volume we think we have, and we have to start again. Next, we're going to set up a burette on a clamp stand. When you clamp a burette in place, um, don't clamp the burette too tightly because you'll crack it. And the other thing is, any time you're using a clamp stand, um, make sure you just tighten everything up because often the stand is wobbly, the individual clamps can be wobbly. Just screw them in place so that everything's nice and tight and won't wobble, which could interfere with how well you can do the experiment. Now, we're going to fill the burette to zero. Um, with our solution of sodium hydroxide again because it's a burette we're going to um, and we're measuring a liquid we're going to make sure that we are carefully noting the um, position of the meniscus and that's where we take our readings from so the, the meniscus is really important in this experiment in our uh, pipette in our volumetric flask and in our burette we're then going to transfer a 25 centimeter cubed alico that really just kind of means sample um, of our acid to a conical flask and add several drops of phenolphthalein indicator and it will start off looking like this okay um, it should be completely colorless at this point then we're going to perform a rough titration so we're going to add sodium hydroxide from the burette really pretty quickly until we get a strong pink color that persists for five seconds or more and this is the color we're looking for it's a really lovely color kind of one of my favorite in, in all the chemistry to be honest um, and that colour should persist for five seconds or more. Now, just, just note, if you leave it to stand for a while, you know, um, several minutes, the um, phenolphthalein will react with carbon dioxide in the air and that colour will fade. So don't worry if that happens. We just need the colour to persist for around five seconds and that tells us we've reached our end point. Then we're going to perform accurate titration. So what we do with the accurate titration is we quickly run through our sodium hydroxide until we get to within a couple of centimetres cubed of our end point from the rough titration. And then we start adding the um, sodium hydroxide much more slowly, perhaps at the rate of about a drop every three seconds. And you'll, you'll start to get to a point where you get these sort of flashes of pink appearing and then disappearing once you stir it. At that point, you need to add just a single drop at a time. And if you get this right, you can get two concordant titers pretty quickly. Remember, a concordant titer is two separate results that are within 0.1 centimeters cubed of each other and once we've got those concordant titers we're going to use the average of them of those of those um, concordant titers to determine the concentration of our hydrochloric acid solution